Hello and welcome to the Toledo Lucas County Public Library's Sight and Sound Video Archive Series. I'm Tom Walton. Uh, our guest today is a man I've known a lot longer than he's known me. That's because I watched him on television for a lot of years before I had the pleasure of making his acquaintance. Gordon Ward is a true Toledo television pioneer and a man whose broadcasting career has spanned several decades. And Gordon, what a delight to have this time with you today. Thank you very much, Tom. I have to tell you, there was a time uh, when we both were a lot younger that all I aspired to be was Gordon Ward. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, so I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. You were born in Amherst, Ohio? Yes, sir. In 1925? 1925. Some of our viewers may not know where Amherst is. Can you talk a little bit about your hometown? Sure. Uh, it's very easy to locate. It's a mile north of Whiskeyville and four miles east of Brownhelm. Now I understand. Now, yeah, that, that pinpoints it's it. It's in Lorraine County, okay. roughly between Lorraine and Eluria. Whiskeyville, just down the road? Huh? Yeah, just right. down the road. Your father, uh, uh, Frank, was a postal worker when you were a child. That's correct. Did you ever uh, consider a career yourself in not, federal government? Not a career, but at the time I was in college, the post office would hire college kids to carry mail during the summer and Christmas vacations. And it was a good source of income and a lot of fun. Yeah, now you grew up during the Depression. Obviously. That's right. Uh, a great crash occurred when you were a four year old child. Yeah. Uh, how did all of that impact your childhood? I think probably those of us who were in that time slot learned to appreciate the little things of life. Uh, everybody was equally poor. Uh, the people who were our next door neighbors uh, literally became multi-millionaires with their business. But during the Depression, we were all equally poor. We learned, uh, and to this day, <laughs> the reason our house is so cluttered, I don't throw anything away. Might need it someday. <laughs> You're a hoarder of sorts, is <laughs> that right? That's right. right. And you learned that lesson during yeah. the Depression, during yeah. the 30s as a child. That's right. And you learn to uh, uh, skimp on things and uh, how to make food stretch. Now, you talked, uh, we talked about your father. He was a postal worker. Uh, what sort of memories do you have of your mother, uh, Anna? He was uh, six feet four. This is your father? Yeah. And in those days, six feet four was a tall person. And I can recall going into Cleveland when we were kids, and he was Uncle Sam in some parade in Cleveland because he was I'm so sure he'd tall. Be an impressive Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah. But today he wouldn't make a professional basketball team <laughs> at 6'4". Well, how tall was your mother, Anna? She was short. She was probably 5'6", or something like that. Oh, what a, what a yeah. contrast, huh? <laughs> what was, uh, how was it, uh, your mother when you were growing up? What was it like uh, with your father off to the job every day? Was your mom a stay-at-home mother and took care of you? She never drove, so she would walk downtown to get the groceries. Uh, she would have the furnace fired up when dad came home. Uh, I should explain that for people who don't understand. You had to shovel coal into the furnace. Believe me, I understand. <laughs> and she would have that fired up so when dad come home, the house would be warm. And then uh, he would take every day uh, a very short nap. And when the weather was good, get out and work in the garden or do work around the house mm -hmm. and uh, the parents, the mothers of uh, those of us who had postal carrier fathers uh, learned to do a lot of things around the house. It's interesting you mentioned your mother did not drive. Of course, automobiles were still kind of a new phenomenon, yeah. were they not, when you were growing up? And do you remember your family's first car? Yeah, well, I have no direct recollection of it, okay. but it was a whippet which was made right mm -hmm. here in Toledo at the Willys plant. And uh, then our second car was a Model A uh, Ford, uh, which I learned to drive on. Then came the war, so that Model A got a lot of miles on it. I'll bet it did. Now you had, well, can you talk about siblings? You had, I think, one sister. One sister, sister three years younger. Margaret, or Peg, as she right. was called. Mm -hmm. She just recently lost to Peg, is that right? Yes, she died uh, three years ago as we sit here in, in 2011. So she right. passed away in 2008. 
Did you play sports when you finally got to high school? No, I did not because uh, as a child at the age of 10, I had tuberculosis and in those days there was no, no treatment except a rest cure. So I had to every day come home and rest and all summer sat on the porch and read. The library was maybe 200 yards away from us, so I was back and forth to the library all the time. So even though you were missing school, you were educating yourself. Well, yes, and uh, did not miss oh. school. I would go to school, but would, could not go out and play sure. afterward. Anyway, that limited my uh, athletic. How long did you battle that? Uh, I think probably a year and a half or two years I'm a little fuzzy on that. A lot that. of folks uh, viewing this uh, in the modern era, or, or, or say the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and, and now in the new century, tuberculosis is a, is a foreign sounding That's right. word to them. That's right. But yet this was not uncommon. Yeah. And it, if people got it in those years, they gave them a shot of something and it was gone. But we had sanatoriums. We had one in Lorraine County mm -hmm. and I had an aunt who worked at the one in Knox County, Mount Vernon, and I would go down there to get my x-rays uh, because it was a family trip to see the aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. Now your distinctive and recognizable voice <laughs> uh, is known throughout our region. Was there uh, a point in your youth when you realized that you could make a living with your voice? I had that aspiration uh, be <laughs> before the voice changed from soprano to whatever it may be now. Uh, I would, uh, when the uh, older boys in the neighborhood were playing basketball, uh, the neighbors who became multimillionaires had a, a, a brick driveway in front of their garage. Not the entire driveway, but kind of an apron. And they had a basketball hoop. And uh, all of the older fellows would play basketball and I would climb up in the uh, cherry tree that was adjacent to the garage and pretend I was broadcasting the game. Now this, I was uh, 10 when we moved away from there, so I probably was eight or nine. All I ever wanted to do in my life was be a radio announcer. Well, you know, it's amazing because I've heard other professional announcers say that very same thing that they, all they wanted to be when they were children was an announcer. And yeah. they would practice uh, calling baseball games yeah. in their room or, or, or whatever it might be, as in your case, basketball. Right. And, and I, I then did PA work uh, when I was in high school for all of the games. Mm -hmm. And so you headed off to college after you graduated from high school. Was it Amherst High School? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you headed off to Bowling Green. Right. And uh, did you... W well, let me first ask you, why Bowling Green? Uh, I think because it was handy and it was cheap. Handy and cheap. <laughs> and uh, another fellow from Amherst and I, uh, I worked after graduating from high school, worked for a year and a half on the railroad to get enough money to go to BG or any school. And uh, we came over and looked at it and uh, took the train, in fact, from Amherst, the main line to the New York Central, uh, arrived in Toledo. I was just talking to someone the other day about this. Uh -huh. Coming into Toledo, we thought we were coming into the stockyards. And here was this gigantic billboard put up, I think, by the Chamber of Commerce, which said, please don't judge Toledo by its Union Station. <laughs> that was before the current one sure. was built, of course. Yeah. Anyway, then took the train down to BG, looked over the campus, and uh, this was 1944, mm -hmm. height of the war, and there were relatively few men on campus at that time. And uh, so they were eager to enroll anyone. I was 4F because I was born with a hernia, and uh, they wouldn't accept me. Don, who came with me, was drafted, as were so many others. Mm -hmm. uh, but we chose BG because it, in those days there was no tuition. We were able to work on campus for our room and board and that was it. Was it a disappointment as a young man in the height of World War II that you couldn't serve? Very disappointing. Uh, 
the doctor who brought me into the world and was our family doctor was also the examining doctor for the uh, draft board. And uh, I went in for, I was called for the exam, went in, and he said, well, you know, we can't, can't take you because if you had a problem out on, he had been in World War I, he said, if you had a problem on a battlefield, that just wouldn't fly. Mm -hmm. I said, do you mind if I get another opinion? He said, no. He was a very jovial guy. He laughed. He said, no, go ahead. He said, I don't think it'll be any different. Well, it was not. And I tried everything. I tried, they had an ambulance corps, which I'm a little uh, fuzzy on. I don't remember how that differed from the military ambulance, but there was an ambulance corps. I tried getting into cryptography, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, I didn't qualify for any of those. Mm -hmm. Came the Korean War, and I was working in Cleveland, and there were two of us on the staff of draft age. The manager called us in one day, and the other guy said, uh, he was an engineer, he said, well, I'm in the Naval Reserve, I know I'll get called. And I said, they were scraping the barrel in World War II and didn't want me. And uh, so sure enough, here came the notice to go out to somewhere on the east side of Cleveland for a physical for the Korean War. And I was pretty cocky going out there. And uh, the doctor examined me. He said, well, you're in, you're in great shape. We'll probably call you in a month. I said, whoa, may I get another opinion on this? <laughs> well. <laughs> the other opinion confirmed his. My hernia had cleared up. And so <laughs> NBC got me a six-month deferment and tried for a second one. And I was drafted just prior to my 26th birthday. That was the cutoff date. Wow, that's pretty late. So, well, yeah. I was running up and down mountains in Pennsylvania with 18-year-olds mm -hmm. and had had a sedentary job. And that was not good. So you did go into the service. Yeah, yeah, I was belatedly right. after you would have liked to. Right. And how long was it? Was that? two years? Two years. Yeah. And did you serve in Korea? No. Uh, there again, uh, the hand of God was at work. I met a guy in Seattle as we were getting on the troop ship. His name was Walter, and my name is Ward. So we were close together in line, and uh, he had a contact in Tokyo. Uh, with a chaplain, to be a chaplain's assistant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget if I went with, I don't recall the total circumstances. At any rate, the champion, or the, cha the chaplain, it's early in the morning, the chaplain said, uh, oh, you were in radio and TV. He said, I think they're looking for some people. He knew the people at the Far East Network. So I auditioned and, and got the job and stayed in Japan and poor Stan Walter went on to Korea and mm -hmm. uh, and fought the battles. So your background served you well in Japan. You did radio oh, yeah. for, the, for, the, for the Army? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's go back a few years again and get back to your arrival at Bowling Green. Did you concentrate your studies in journalism? I minored in journalism, uh -huh. majored in the generic speech. Uh, they had a radio uh, class and a radio studio. Of course, television had not arrived at that point. Did you work for the campus uh, radio station? We... <laughs> WBGU, I believe. <laughs> the, the radio station that we had, uh, we would uh, go into the studio and stick a speaker out the window facing Williams Hall, which was a girl's dorm at that time. And then we would play music at, after lights out over there. And then they came up with what they called wired wireless, where they would run a uh, signal, a very low power signal, through all of the steam pipes that fed the campus. Mm -hmm. And so if you lived in a dorm, uh, of which there were only a few back then, but if you lived in a dorm that was fed by the campus steam, you could turn on your radio <laughs> and pick up whatever we were doing. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you were a big hit in the dormitories oh, late, <laughs> late at night, yes. <laughs> How did you decide, uh, Gordon, that a uh, career in broadcast journalism was for you? I felt that uh, I had done 
some writing uh, for the high school newspaper and uh, felt that maybe I should pursue that. I always wanted to get into broadcasting. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm mouthy. <laughs> I decided to take advantage of that and uh, also there were outstanding journalism professors at BG. You picked up on the tail end of some of the great ones, Jess Courier, for example, mm -hmm. and Paul Jones, and uh, learned an awful lot. Uh, these were people who taught not only from the book, but they had had the experience, mm -hmm. and you learned an awful lot. And I decided that uh, that would be the, the way to go. Now, as a young uh, professional in the late 19, you graduated from Bowling Green in four, 1948, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And as a young professional in the late 1940s, I think your timing was impeccable. It uh, was. You saw the twilight, kind of, if you will, of the golden age of, uh, of radio, but yet you were also part of an emerging uh, era of the time of television. Uh, can you talk about that, that whole evolution? Oh, yeah, yeah. When I graduated, I was convinced that I was the greatest radio announcer that ever lived. How do you know that you weren't? Well, uh, we, but we, I was we, the only I might say the same thing of you. <laughs> I was the only one who knew it. <laughs> I, I couldn't get a job. So I washed windows for a living and uh, to pay off uh, some minor college debts. And then Jay Wagner at WLEC in Sandusky hired me. I was there uh, about a month, went into Cleveland one day just to do some sightseeing, stopped in at the NBC station there. KYW? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was uh, WNBC in those days, okay. WTAM radio. And uh, Joe Mulvihill uh, was a top disc jockey. And I had done some work while I was in college. We used to take a group of college students maybe once a month to uh, Cleveland to do a live show, everything was live, uh, on radio, this is before TV, and uh, stopped to see Joe and he said, well, why don't you take an audition? In those days, you could walk in off the street on certain days and take an audition at NBC. But I wasn't dressed, uh, I, I was wearing a sports shirt, and you know, that was a no-no back then. He, ah, don't worry about it. So I went and took the audition and won it, and uh, they were hiring one more announcer because they were about to go on with TV. Hmm. So um, I was hired and two weeks later began, and the Indians were winning the World Series, or they were playing the World Series. This is in the fall of 1948. 48, and that was a real thrill to, as a young kid, uh, stand there hmm. and see legends. Uh, vivid memory of Connie Mack coming in with his celluloid collar and his straw hat uh, and all of the other legends of the day were there as well. Uh, Cleveland simply because it was close to where you'd grown up? Uh, 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 and as yes. You, as you explained, sort of just good fortune. You go out and show up for an audition and oh, yeah. they're hiring somebody. <laughs> what luck? That yeah, was. I uh, you know, I had fully expected to uh, work in Sandusky for perhaps a year or two years to get some experience mm -hmm. uh, and then shoot for the bigger markets, never dreaming that, uh, first of all, that I would be hired in one of them. Uh, I was in Sandusky, I was making $40 a week, and in Cleveland, the beginning salary was 120 a week. So that was a huge jump. I should guess so. And, uh, and of course, being able to uh, be on the very first staff of a TV station was great. What were your duties uh, as they went into TV? We uh, alternated uh, between radio and TV. So you'd work a couple hours in radio and go over, work a couple hours in TV. And were you doing that, news? I beg your pardon? News? Doing news? No, no. We. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first news show on the station was all slides, five minutes, I happened to do it. Uh, uh, we did not go to live news for I don't know how many years, but we would do station breaks and uh, host whatever live 
uh, material we had on TV, we'd go on the air at 5 and go sign off at 11. People find that amazing today. Yeah. I still remember when they'd play the Star Spangled Banner at the oh, end yeah. of the broadcast day, and then that was it. Yeah, and we would do prior to that, mm -hmm. whoever was on duty would read uh, a script that told who owned the station and mm -hmm. uh, what channel we were on or on radio, what frequency, and uh, we hope you will join us tomorrow morning. Uh, uh, you were in Cleveland for about 10 years. Yes. And I think in 1958, uh, you had an opportunity to move to Toledo. Right. How did that happen? Uh, there was an interim. I left uh, the ownership of uh, the station in Cleveland changed. David Sarnoff, uh, who was head of RCA and NBC, wanted in the worst way to have a station near the headquarters in Camden, New Jersey. He forced uh, Westinghouse to give up their Camden station uh, in exchange for the Cleveland station. So NBC went to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and I said Camden, I meant Philly. Uh, the Philadelphia Westinghouse station then came to Cleveland. That's when the call letters changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did not uh, go along with the philosophy of the new owners, and I was able to needle them into firing me because I had at that point been there for nine years. Mm -hmm. If I quit, I got nothing. Mm -hmm. If they fired me, got, I got a week's pay for every year that I'd been there. I can't imagine you making yourself a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> I was young and reckless and single. I didn't have to worry. As things turned out, though, there was an opportunity uh, uh, in well, Toledo. In the interim, I, uh, Jay Wagner at WLEC in Sandusky again called and said, hey, the National Association of Broadcasters is looking for a field representative. Are you interested? And I said, sure. So I worked for them for a year and a half. What exactly does that mean, field representative for the NAB? Well, the job was to uh, call on radio and TV stations around the country, and uh, if they were not members, ask them to become members, show them the benefits of membership. But you weren't doing any broadcasting None. in that capacity. You must have missed it. Oh, I did, terrifically. So how long did you do that? A year and a half. Then I got a call. Uh, I was up in Wisconsin, got a call that uh, the gas company was going to have a show, a news show, on a brand new station that was going on in Toledo, Channel 11. Uh, would I be interested? Uh, the fellow who called me is someone I had known who married a girl from Amherst. And uh, so I came in, took the audition, uh, which was at the Hillcrest Hotel where WTOL got started. And uh, they, it was a, a crazy uh, way of doing an audition, unlike anything I had ever seen. And they had a meal for us and the whole thing. And uh, then they wanted everyone to wait around. There were 23 people who auditioned. For one for opportunity? For one show. And uh, the gas company had shows in uh, Columbus, Springfield, uh, no, uh, Columbus, Zanesville, and Toledo then. And they wanted... You mean they the, sponsored yes. the show? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. It was a 15-minute show. Newscast? Beg your pardon? Was it a news game? Yes, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So long story short, you got, got it. Yeah. a job. You beat 22 others out of that opportunity. Yeah. What uh, You had to be excited to get back into on the air. Oh, I really was. Broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a ham at heart. <laughs> <laughs> so this was in 1958. 58 again. Okay. And you were at WTOL doing and, and doing TV right away. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. and only TV. Yeah. Did you? And only that one show. I was doing nothing else. Did you find that you liked TV better than you did radio? Oh, much better. Why? You can use all of your senses uh, in radio. Radio has a lot of advantages. For example, in drama, you use your own mind to conceive what's going on with the script. Uh, and there are many advantages, but uh, for example, uh, 
I broadcast professional hockey in Cleveland on radio. It's very difficult to try to follow a game that's that, that fast mm -hmm. and get all of the action. Whereas if it were on TV, the minimal description would be adequate. On the other hand, broadcasting hockey on radio, uh, if you make a mistake, who's going to know? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's like doing golf on radio. I, mean, yeah. I can't imagine anything less exciting than that. Um, any regrets, though, about leaving Cleveland when it, as it turned down? No, I, actually, I've never had any regrets about any of the job changes that have been involved. Now, later, you were part of, uh, we haven't touched on this part of it yet, and uh, the continuing evolution of television from black and white to color. And I think I remember a special telecast was it at WTOL, was it, when you made the switch, you had an on-the-air thing where you actually, somebody flipped the switch. Am I recalling that correctly? Was there a... I think that uh, I have no clear recollection, but I believe that's correct. But what was that time like? That had to feel like almost some of the changes we're seeing today in the modern, in the new technological age with Twitters and, and cell phones oh, yeah. and all. That was just as big a deal in its time, wasn't it? Oh, indeed. I'll never forget the very first uh, color commercial, 7.30 at night, and this is in Cleveland, I don't remember the year, and it was for uh, Sunbeam uh, electric frying pan, and it showed bacon and eggs cooking. And that thing was so real because everything had been black and white prior to that. That was so real that you could practically smell it. Mm -hmm. And then in 1958 at the uh, uh, NAB convention in Los Angeles, they came out with the first videotape, two and a quarter inches, and uh, they had a beach scene with white sand and all models in colorful bathing suits and beach balls and umbrellas and stuff, and you could look at that scene and then you could look over here where they had the tape playing and compare the color. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, our, our kids and our grandkids, what do you mean black and white? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's sort of like the beginning of the Wizard of Oz. For, That's right. You know, they wonder what in the world were they thinking? <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, yeah, that was, a, that was quite an exciting time. And of course, one thing I, most of us remember of from the cult early days of color was at NBC Peacock. Oh, yeah. Uh, brought to you on NBC in living color. Of right. course, the, we'd see that. Uh, that was amazing to me. <laughs> as a, as a young. Who were the, uh, before we get totally away from radio, uh, who were the professionals in radio news, uh, Gordon, that inspired you the most as a, oh, young, as a, as a young man, Lowell Thomas? Oh, definitely. Yeah. What was it about Lowell Thomas? Well, I, I wish I could define some specific thing, and I can't. I, uh, it's interesting you ask that question because I've often wondered uh -huh. myself. He had a likability. He had certainly the knowledge. He had the voice, uh, and he was very conversational in what he did. And I can remember as a kid listening to him on radio, uh, and he would blow something, make some kind of a mistake, mm -hmm. and he and his announcer, <laughs> Hugh James, would get to laughing. And, you know, he has some classic uh, stuff floating around. Well, everything, as you say, was done pretty much live, uh, so things like that were going to happen. That's uh, right. What about later in TV news? Uh, Edward R. Murrow, uh, Walter Cronkite, who were the people that, that you admired the most? Uh, Huntley and Brinkley, uh, who had contrasting styles mm -hmm. and uh, really did a great job. Complemented each other. Didn't yes. They? Uh, Murrow, of course, was in a class by himself, as was Cronkite. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a chance to meet any of those folks? Uh, only, well, I met uh, Brinkley once uh, and met Lowell Thomas a couple times. <laughs> he, uh, he was on a telephone line for the Toledo Rotary Club when they were meeting at the Commodore Perry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I recall, Toledo has one of the largest Rotary Clubs, or did at that time. Still does. And about 500 people, mm -hmm. I think. At any rate, uh, Lowell Thomas was in his office on a, a line, 
and I was to kind of moderate and uh, take questions from the audience. Well, they weren't coming in very fast. So, you know, from your years as a reporter, don't ask something that's got to make you look bad. And I never thought of it. I said, well, is there any place in the world that you have not been that you would like to have gone to? Everybody in his brother has asked him that question, but that didn't occur to me at that time. <laughs> Without missing a beat, he said, yes, someday I'd like to go to Coshocton. <laughs> and he had some town in line for every state of the union, I'm, I'm sure. sure. He did. Yeah. Uh, I think I know the answer to this question, Gordon, uh, based on what you've explained, but did you ever consider a career in print journalism? Uh, to be honest, no. In the back of my mind, I always felt that if for some reason I didn't make it in broadcasting, I, I could go to print because uh, I'm a fair writer, but uh, I, I preferred the broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Did you always know that you wanted to do news and not sports, for example? You already did some hockey on radio, but, but you, news was what, what called you, right? Uh, well, when I was in Cleveland, I had to make that decision because mm -hmm. I did both. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the career, uh, did both. But I had to make a decision whether I was going to uh, concentrate on news or sports, and I decided to go with <coughs> news. Uh, and in hindsight, I'm glad I did, mm -hmm. because I broadcast uh, high school bas or high school and college basketball and football. Uh, could have done baseball, didn't. Uh, did professional <laughs> hockey. The only one of those sports that I could sit down and do today is hockey, because the only thing that's changed about hockey is the way they keep time. They used to start the clock at zero. So if you scored a goal, uh, 14 uh, minutes and 12 seconds, you would say at 14, 12 of the third period. Now it's just the reverse, you have to subtract. Exactly. <laughs> but all of the others have changed mm -hmm. so dramatically. Uh, I, I, Dr. Naismith did not envision basketball as a contact sport. And, but that's what it's if become. You watch the NBA, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. And the, uh, f of both football and uh, baseball have changed terminology sure. and rules so much that I would have difficulty. But I could sit down today and do a hockey game. You ever tempted when you're watching a hockey game just to turn the volume down and <laughs> let it go? <laughs> On uh, occasion. Many of the folks uh, watching us, uh, Gordon, remember your contributions to TV news, certainly, but they also remember another member of the staff at WTOL, and that was Miss Connie. Miss Connie was host of the popular children's show Romper Room, and uh, Miss Connie became Mrs. Ward. Uh, do you recall the day you met Connie? Oh, very well. Uh, the assistant in our promotion department at the station uh, <laughs> said, I have a roommate, there were four girls who shared an apartment, she said, I have a roommate you ought to meet. And she said, my grandmother is coming out from New Jersey, and I'm going to have a party for Grandma. Uh, would you come? And I did, met Connie, and that was the beginning. Can you talk about your courtship? Yes. <laughs> she uh, thought it was going rather slowly <laughs> and began dating a couple other people. And I decided I'd better get it. That in got gear. your attention, didn't it? That's right. <laughs> so uh, I think probably we were, we dated for uh, two or three years before we were engaged. Did your work schedules mesh, uh, or was that a conflict? Uh, she worked days. Romper Room in its early days was live, uh, as everything was, and I worked uh, the seven to seven fifteen shift, but it worked out. Mm -hmm. It worked out. Uh, the courtship did so well that your wedding was televised. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> Steve Fair, who was the promotion director at WTOL, thought he had a dream on his hands because uh, my new show was top rated. Romper Room, of course, was top rated. And uh, so he asked if we would 
give some thought to that. Well, uh, today she would be in favor and I would be opposed. And tomorrow <laughs> it would switch. Well, one day he caught us when we were both in favor of having it televised and uh, on it went. Uh, what was the public reaction like to that event? <laughs> I guess pretty good, uh, especially kids uh, and parents following Connie. And, uh, and I think the, uh, the reaction was good. It was, this was right in the studio? So oh no, we were. Where did you do the, the, the? We were married at First Congregational Church. So here was a remote telecast uh, when that was sort of. That unusual. was very rare. They set up a microwave tower at the church, beamed it back to the station, and uh, taped it. And then <clears throat> I'm not sure the time that it ran on the air, but by the time the reception line was over. Uh, we went into the room where the reception was to be. Everybody had cleaned up and left. They had gone to the, to the bars or to their home, wherever there was a TV set, to watch it on TV. So it was on tape delay. It wasn't, it wasn't televised live. It was not live. live. I see. So you were able, do you still have it today? Is there a copy of that around? We have it. We can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, they, why don't you go back to W2L and renew your vows? Yeah. Now there's a thought. <laughs> in uh, one more year, uh, 19, uh, 19, or 2012, it'll be 50 years. Amazing. So. Well, congratulations <laughs> in advance. Uh, after four years at W2L, though, you uh, moved to WSPD-TV mm -hmm. to become the evening news anchor. A lot of folks watching us would identify you perhaps more with WSPD because of the length of time you were yeah. there. Um, as the evening news anchor, why did that move occur for you? Well, there again, it was a change of station ownership and uh, some changes in philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I didn't particularly agree with. And uh, so I had been offered a job at Channel 13 prior to that and uh, called and asked if the offer were still good, and it was, so mm -hmm. I made the switch. Sounds like every time you've had a philosophical disagreement, you've landed on your feet. <laughs> I've been very fortunate. Yes, indeed. When you became, and you were fortunate also because you became part of a very special news team at WSBD TV. And can you talk about some of those people? Frank Venner. Frank Venner. He and I uh, would be the odd couple of television. Frank is a neatnik. And uh, as you know from working with teletype copy, get a huge long sheet of paper and you uh, decide what you're going to use. Frank would have it all cut up in little bits and pieces, very neatly piled on his desk. I'm at the adjacent desk. I've got paper everywhere, streaming off the desk into the waste basket. <laughs> we, we were, we're, we both get along beautifully, even today but we're totally opposite in, uh, in our uh, approach to I news. think, wasn't your initial show, the Venner Ward Correct. report? Yeah. And talk about top rated, I think that, that became the top, one of the top rated newscasts. I think I? it did. Yeah. And John Saunders was John there Saunders. at that time. And of course, Frank Gilhooley, yeah. who was the epitome of- I was uh, gonna ask you about both of them. First, John Saunders, what, what do you remember working with John? John is probably the greatest writer that I have ever worked with. Uh, he was meticulous. The rest of us would uh, write something and maybe go back and change a word or two. John would sweat over every single word mm -hmm. and uh, Consequently, his writing was uh, just top-notch, and uh, he was great. And Frank O'Hooley, of course, became, went on to become an institution here in Toledo. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It was our pleasure to sit down with Frank in that, with Frank oh, in that chair not too long ago before, uh, and so uh, that was quite an opportunity for us. Yeah. Well, what a, what a wonderful man. Frank was just loaded with stories and knew everybody in sports. Uh, if his phone rang and he happened not to be at his desk, uh, occasionally I would pick it up 
And I, I couldn't believe my ears. There would be some famous athlete on the other end of the line calling just to shoot the breeze with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he knew everybody. He, he had uh, Babe Ruth as a babysitter when he was a, <laughs> That's an right. a child. Yeah, he still has the, he had the pictures to prove it. Yeah. Uh, Jim Rudes. Jim Rudes was a top-notch actor. Uh, he, too, uh, was a pioneer in television. Mm -hmm. He and Frank Venner uh, were pioneers. They had been in radio here at WSPD, went on the air about six months earlier than the Cleveland station for which I worked. Mm -hmm. But the same parallel, uh, radio mm -hmm. transitioned into TV. They both worked, both radio and TV. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim was a consummate actor. There will never be a, a better Scrooge than Jim. Uh, who, Community theater sort yes, of thing, yes. He did uh, a lot of community theater and his, in his later years, portrayal of Scrooge was just outstanding. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a good actor in, in all respects. And that carried into his presentation on the air. Wasn't he uh, uh, the anchor before you arrived yes. at Channel 13? Mm -hmm. right. Did that affect your relationships with Jim at all? I don't think it did. Mm -hmm. We were very good friends. Mm -hmm. Most people remember for first Frank Venner, for, of course, for his weather and the weather reports where he'd be outside in the elements, <laughs> yeah. writing backwards on right. that acrylic board. Right. But I think Jim Rudes did that before he, Frank. He did too, yes. Uh huh. Uh, did you ha ever have ambitions beyond Toledo, Gordon? Did you want to become a network news anchor if that were to happen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would love to have done that. Uh, I auditioned uh, over the years at all three of the networks in New York City. Uh, you know, it, you set up a, a date and you can go in and audition. Today they don't do that, they use tapes, but uh, never clicked. There, were, there was a fellow the name of John Hicks with whom I had worked in Cleveland and I walked into audition at ABC in New York and here was John also there for an audition. I knew my goose was cooked right then because uh, he was so much better. So did you finally just, you decided that the, the Toledo market was a pretty good market, just about a the right size? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what do you consider the, the biggest stories you ever covered, either as a reporter or as an anchor? Uh, I think probably the Cal Poly plane crash of 1960. At Toledo Airport. At the Toledo Airport. Uh, I had filmed, I had just received a film camera, uh, movie camera, and was actually uh, shooting this football game just to see how the camera worked. Jim Roots was there filming it for the, sta uh, the station. I was at TOL. This was earlier in the day that when, yeah, when at Bowling BG. Green played Cal Poly. Right. And uh, so that night got word that uh, the plane had crashed. It was extremely foggy. I had just moved into a house. I was single, built a house, and uh, didn't even know the way to get to the airport. That was before the expressways. Mm -hmm. And anyway, fumbled my way out there. And the tragedy of that uh, was that so many people, uh, they had a, a makeshift morgue uh, laid out in the lobby, and the lobby was all windows on the driveway side. So many people brought their young children, got them up out of bed and brought them out. And I've never understood the morbidity of that uh, and the tragedy the of it. The fascination with, with death. Oh, yes. The poor coach, I happened to be in the lobby when the, uh, the I think he was an assistant coach. I don't recall his name right offhand, but he had to go through and identify each of these players and the bodies were in bad shape. Uh, it was a horrible crash and I felt so sorry for the man uh, and cannot imagine the emotions that, but that, that will remain the, the yeah. top story, most memorable. Sure, and you were, you were first and foremost a reporter yeah. that night. Right. Which 
leads me to ask, so many of the people we see doing new television news today are characterized as news readers right. and not news reporters. Right. Uh, they have reporters in the field, but uh, they are considered readers. Is that an evolution you didn't approve of? I, did you think of yourself first as a reporter? Oh, always, yes. And I made it a habit uh, to get around into the courthouse every day, uh, to get to the police station every day. And as you know from your background, you build up uh, confidence among the people you're dealing with. And uh, I'll go to the grave with secrets that were told to me by uh, either people in the courts or people in the police department sworn to secrecy and uh, and I'll take those secrets to the grave. Well, as long as you didn't violate that, yeah. they trusted you, sure. But that gave the background mm -hmm. for uh, asking questions and so forth. Now, what about competition? Uh, you certainly had to worry about the other the guys at the other station. You yes. certainly had the blade every day to be right. concerned about. How important was it to beat the other guys? Oh, very important. Anytime you could do that. Of course, today, every everything is exclusive. Well, we didn't do that, but when we were able to beat the competition, we were more than delighted. Today, you hear things like the I Team. The yeah. Invest, you know, out there uh, comparing prices of groceries to maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, but they put this fancy title on it. And, right. Uh, it was a different time, wasn't it? Oh, totally different. And the environment in which we lived was so different mm -hmm. from what it is today. Uh, now, at the same time, when you touched on this a little earlier when, when you spoke of Lowell Thomas. TV, live TV, invites goofs, invites embarrassments, uh, incidents you wished hadn't happened. <laughs> Can you share any of those? <laughs> uh, there oh, have been many, but I think the, the funniest one, uh, Frank Venner was off one night. John Saunders was doing the 11 o'clock news with me. And uh, in those days, it was film. This is before we had videotape as we do now. And uh, the film would uh, be brought back, would go through a huge machine, took it a half hour from start to finish to process the film to get it on the air. So. Uh, this was the coverage of the Lucas County Fair. And, you know, there's no, no way you can mess that up. So I wrote the story and uh, I told the uh, film editor that uh, I think the story was 30 seconds. I said, give me 40 seconds of film. And the two were never together until they got on the air. Uh, there's no need, you know, what can go wrong? So the, the opening line, <laughs> there was a capacity crowd at the Lucas County Fair tonight. You've got a picture of one old guy alone in the grandstand with his hat over his eyes, sound asleep. Well, I thought that's kind of funny. And uh, I said they were attracted by the grandstand highlight, country and western singer Loretta Lynn. And with that, you get a tight shot of a gigantic sow panting in the straw. Well, now I begin to lose it. And the uh, closing line uh, was, and the uh, junior, I've forgotten specifics, the junior queen of the fair was, at which point we see the south end of a cow headed north right in front of the camera. Well, by now I've blown it. Saunders, who normally did not laugh much out loud, was in hysterics. Uh, Tom Perna, the director, went to a commercial because we couldn't do anything. He said, all right, can one of you get your act together out there? <laughs> Pick up, because each of us had stories to read. And uh, I said, oh yeah, we'll be all right. So we came back and I started to read the next story, couldn't make it. John picked it up. He tried it. Couldn't make it. <laughs> so but wait, I thought you guys were trained professionals. <laughs> yeah, very professional. <laughs> we were human. That's funny. I hope you didn't hear from the mother of the queen. Uh, no, but you, our station manager said, look, you've embarrassed that girl. You go out there 
the next night uh, and, and apologize to her. So I did. And she said, what are you talking about? I didn't <laughs> see. <laughs> she must have been watching the other station. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Now, uh, you did some traveling in connection with your job. There was something called Adventure Hawaii. Oh, uh, my goodness. And, and a Scandinavian cruise. Wow. What a tough life you had yeah. as a TV journalist. <laughs> Was that to engage the viewers? I mean, did you take viewers along on these trips? Yes, the Hawaiian trip, uh, they were hoping to get 50 people to go, and there was a total of 97. And uh, Connie and I, of course they had native guides all the way, but, uh, and the owner of the travel agency, Raleigh Zachman, was along. Uh, but Connie and I were the, the ones they used to market it. The Scandinavian trip, uh, they only had six people sign up for it, and uh, so I went alone on that trip. Uh, in that connection, Gordon, uh, it kind of invites the question about your approachability. You're one of the most likable TV personalities, <laughs> as or just likable individuals I've ever known. Well, thank uh, you. Unlike some of the f people in the industry who might be a little standoffish. That was never your style. Why was that so important to you? I think a lot of it had to do with my growing up in a small town where everybody knew everybody and uh, we all got along. There were 52 people in my high school graduating class and all of us got along. I think that's part of it and also uh, I like people. Uh, people are interesting and that's where the stories are. And so I enjoy people. A lot of, a lot of the performers don't. And people liked you. That was an, it <laughs> well, worked out you. nice that way. Gordon, you retired uh, from your broadcasting career, at least, in 1987. Correct. Uh, somewhat surprising to some because you were still a very youthful, what, 62 or so. Right. Was it simply time? Uh, I had the sense that uh, if if I did not retire, I might have had a, a letter of goodbye. So I, I just felt that that was, they were wanting the younger people on the air, and uh, I had been relegated to doing very little, mm. so I decided I would just. There's a perception out there, rightly or wrongly, that it is women who age and therefore are not wanted anymore <laughs> on the set. <laughs> Uh, but in your case, you were concerned that it was going to happen to you as well. Yes. Is that a truism about women? Are they not kept around as long as I the think men? it is, yes, and it's sad. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, very rare exception was Dorothy Fuldheim in Cleveland, who uh, I think worked until she was 90. But uh, generally speaking, uh, they want the younger younger people. Well, you retired, and as I say, you're still young at 62. Uh, it seems very young to me at my current <laughs> age. Uh, but you went into doing TV commercial work mm -hmm. uh, fairly soon after that. How did that come about? I was approached by uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Matt McClavick, who had an ad agency at that time, and uh, wanting me to do commercials, and so I was happy to do it, and since then, uh, not only I, but some of the other uh, older fellows have done commercials because the sponsors feel that there is deg a degree of credibility with the older folks. And I just recently did one uh, <laughs> at 85, who would have dreamed it, uh, because the pitch was the product was being uh, marketed to an older audience and they felt that an older pitchman could do the job. Uh, two years after your retirement, you also became executive director of something called the Greater Toledo Citizens Against Pornography. It must have been an issue about which you felt very strongly. Oh yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the whole thing flopped and it's tragic uh, that it did, uh, uh, not only in Toledo but mm -hmm. nationally. Because I think that uh, not only pornography but all of the other baser elements of society are going to do what Khrushchev predicted. Mm -hmm. 
He said, we'll bury you without firing a shot. Mm -hmm. And it's happening, tragically. Internet, principally. Yeah, uh, and, but the call stuff people. on the air. Mm -hmm. I'm astounded when on I... On network TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Things that would never have gotten by the censors oh, in no. the 60s no. or 70s. Movies, uh, what, what is currently called music, uh, it's not, <laughs> not what I would call music, but it, you know, it is, everything is so raunchy. And I worry about my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Uh, what kind of civilization are they, they growing up in? Yeah. And I think, our, uh, unfortunately, we're headed down the tubes in this country. Now, in that regard, I know that uh, most news media professionals are always striving to separate uh, their own personal feelings right. from their professional obligations and the news they report. You did, I did. Sure. Was that something you had to constantly guard against, not letting the two mix? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, actually, it was sometimes a chore to make sure that you went right down the middle. and. I would say that 95% of the time, people uh, watching or listening had no idea what the person's political bent was. And that was the whole point. You wanted exactly. It exactly. Uh, you've been very generous with your time and your retirement years, and you have been an important part of the popular Music Under the Stars program mm -hmm. at the Toledo Zoo, which, as we sit here in 2011, is on hiatus for a time. Uh, can you talk about your long affiliation with the Toledo Concert Band and specifically Sam Zor? Absolutely. Uh, the year I retired, Sam called me and said uh, the fellow Tom Bolin, who had been the MC for the Music Under the Stars, was moving away from Toledo. Would I be interested in doing it? I am not a musician. I don't know a single note. I, I can't sing, I, can't, I don't play any instrument, but I love music, good music. And uh, so I jumped at that opportunity, of course, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. It's a, Toledo is unique in having music under the stars. There are no other cities that I'm aware of where you have a, a professional band uh, playing eight Sunday nights in July and August with no admission charge, mm -hmm. thanks to the generosity of the sponsors. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are no other, I know some years back, uh, oh, perhaps um, 1980 or something like that, I have a cousin in Los Angeles, and back then they were charging $35 oh a night. For what to, you could see free yeah, in Toledo. Exactly. Yeah. I remember our paths crossing once on the stage at the uh, Toledo Zoo during one of the shows. You were the conductor. I was the, uh, I, my assignment was to present you with some sort of an award, uh, which I did, but after we were finished with that, Sam Zor said, I need a break, and off he went and handed <laughs> me the baton. Well, the next number was the Toledo Blade March. I didn't know he was going <laughs> to leave me stranded there on the stage, so we got through it. But you did a good job. <laughs> well, hard to mess up a march. Um, I don't want. I shouldn't tell you this, but they just ignore you. They I know <laughs> the band was on automatic pilot. <laughs> Sam was kind enough not to say that. <laughs> Similarly, you've had a long interest in, uh, in barbershop singing and emceed mm -hmm. uh, local barbershop events. Now you've just said you don't sing, but did you? With the bar, or were you just there in, an, in a capacity to announce the program? I have just been the MC with the local group since they were formed. My first year, they uh, had me sing with a quartet. Uh, that ended that quartet. They, they <laughs> yeah. And they, they gave me a plaque and they said, you'll never have to sing again. And I, they haven't allowed me to. <laughs> well, you must have been serious when you said you couldn't sing. Uh, you brought that, uh, that quartet to its demise. You have also lent your voice and your talent to the Seagate uh, Regatta, uh, sailing regatta. Are you a sailor? I had been when I was single. After I was married, uh, we no longer had a boat. But yeah, I, uh, I had a star class sailboat 
Uh, you which, raced it at one time, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, raced. I, it was in the fleet at Vermilion, uh -huh. and uh, I was I had the oldest boat, and I was the poorest sailor uh, there. But I enjoyed getting out. Now uh, you and I have uh, something in common, Gordon. That is our concern about abuse of our beautiful English language. Yes. You've spoken about it. I've written about it. Uh, why is that so important to you? Oh boy, I think that if we don't know how to express ourselves adequately, if we uh, lack lapse into uh, poor English, th there again, that's just a part of our decaying culture. One of the things that uh, just drives me up a wall is uh, people who say, well, let's find out where we're at. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your former bosses, Paul Schrader, uh, was a, he and I were on the Salvation Army board together, mm -hmm. and he was always critiquing me. <laughs> was, I didn't invite him to, but, yeah. but he did, and I appreciated it. Uh, I, I didn't make a lot of mistakes. I, I grew up with a high school teacher and with college teachers who insisted on proper grammar and the proper use of the English language. How many times do you see quotes in the newspaper, say from an athlete, saying, me and Jim played oh, really yeah. good. Yeah. And I just cringe. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, if you had not become a broadcaster, what career path do you think would have come along for you? Probably railroading. I worked on the railroad for a year and a half after I got out of uh, high school to earn the money to go to what college. What was your job on the railroad? I was a yard clerk, which meant uh, I worked in Lorraine, uh, which had a huge yard adjacent to the seal mill there. We had 10 tracks for the New York Central, 10 tracks for the nickel plate, and the job of the yard clerk was to go up and down each track and uh, copy down the number on the car, <laughs> the length of the empty cars, the cargo of the cars that were loaded, and uh, then record all of that in a big book uh, in the office. Well, New York Central's loss was uh, TV news's gain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, talk about your, uh, your family, your children. You have four children, I believe. We have four children. And where are they? The oldest is uh, married and living in Bay Village with three grandchildren. And uh, second oldest is single in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, had gone there to work on his master's in broadcasting. Uh, and had a part-time job at UPS. He ran out of money and uh, went full-time with UPS as a driver, and he's now making so much money he can't afford to go into broadcasting. <laughs> Third oldest in Catlettsburg, Kentucky, with three grandchildren, uh, and uh, she is a dental assistant, and uh, her husband is an auditor with Marathon Oil. And the youngest is in New York, single, um, has been in the fashion industry, but uh, within the last couple of years joined uh, Ogilvy Mather ad agency. Oh. Uh, your friends, of course, uh, anyone watching us knows you as Gordon. Uh, a lot of us also know you mm. as Skip. Can you explain how you happen to get the nickname? <laughs> when my parents were married, they lived in an apartment above a funeral home in Amherst. And there were some young fellows in the neighborhood, teenagers, who would, uh, you know, here's a young married couple, and they took a shine to my folks, and they'd come over and hang around and uh, always come in to read the funny papers on Sunday morning prior to going to Sunday school. And uh, there was a popular comic strip by the name of Skippy. And so when it was apparent my mother was going to have a baby, they said, well, if it's a boy, you're going to call him Skippy. And ironically, no one in the family does to this day, but there are many people who don't know that I have a name other than Skip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you graduated, as we mentioned earlier, from Bowling Green State University in 1948. Over the years, you've remained very active as an alumnus of BGSU. 
You even served as president of the Alumni Association Board of Trustees. Why was that affiliation so important to maintain over the years for you? Uh, Bowling Green meant, still does, an awful lot to me. And uh, I felt that this was a way of uh, paying back. I've not been able to be a big financial supporter, but by investing time and uh, and hopefully experience, it's uh, been an opportunity to pay back. Because the, uh, when I started, uh, there were 1,200 my freshman year. My senior year, 4,800 because the war had ended mm -hmm. and uh, all the GIs were back. And uh, so I saw both sides of the school as a small uh, school and as one that was burgeoning into a much larger one. Uh, as we wind down here, Gordon, Skip, uh, I'd like to get a little bit philosophical with you. Uh, I like to think you and I served our respective professions at the perfect time. The golden age of local and network TV news and the heyday of newspapers. Uh, both our industries, though, are changing dramatically. People get their news from a variety of sources that we didn't even know about when we were young, that didn't exist. What do you think are the implications for local and network TV news going forward? I think the uh, network uh, obviously has a place. You know, you can, today with modern technology, you can watch a war live on the other side of the world. Uh, that will forever, I think, be the assignment of network news. Uh, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. Uh, locally, I believe they are heading in the right direction. They've dramatically shortened stories. Did you see essentially see newspapers and TV as more complementary than uh, at each other in the sense that the stories on the TV provided immediacy, but stories in the paper provided the detail? I think that has been true from the very beginning, Tom. Uh, I know that when TV came on in Cleveland. The newspapers were concerned, the library was concerned, uh, the movies were concerned, and none of those fears came about because newspapers can go into great depth and great detail, uh, cover a lot of stories that the other, uh, either broadcast media can cover. Do, do you despair that uh, younger viewers and younger readers uh, may not have the same passion yes. for traditional TV news and traditional print journalism? Absolutely. I grew up in a home with uh, three newspapers mm -hmm. and a number of magazines. And uh, one, maybe two of our kids do not take a daily newspaper. And I think that is tragic. I read uh, uh, four papers, I say read, that's not correct, read them online uh, each day. But you only get a flavor. I like to hold that paper in my hand. and Cup of coffee, turn the pages. Yep, Some yep. tactile pleasure there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gordon, Skip, if you will, uh, it's been enlightening. Uh, it's been fun. And I thank you for the gift of your time today. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for inviting me to be with you. My pleasure. And thank all of you for visiting the Toledo-Lucas County Public Library Sight and Sound Video Archives.